Is there any room in your heart for love to grow? What does that even mean? To the teenager whose heart has been crushed, is there any room for love to grow? To the struggling married couple, is there any room for love to grow? To the single person who fears loneliness in the middle of a crowd, or the divorcee or the widow who heart, whose heart seems to have been missing for so many years, is there any room for love to grow? Is it possible to experience love again? The phrase we use for people who become romantically involved is this idea of falling in love again. And usually when we talk about falling in love again, we're talking about this, this idea in which two people will start to think of one another beyond just friendships. When you think of, I'm falling in love with someone, you say, I can't get her out of my mind. I think about her when I wake up, and I think about her when I go to bed. I just can't stop thinking about her. Or if the girl, just the opposite. I can't stop thinking about him. I think I'm falling in love. It's that idea where I want to move beyond friendship. I want to move beyond just being friends. But the Bible doesn't really talk about this concept and idea of falling in love. Well, the Bible does mention passion. All you have to do is turn to the Song of Solomon. and You'll get all the passion you want within the bounds of marriage. And in fact, I would challenge you married couples, read through that book tonight and tell me you don't feel passionate. You must be dead if you don't. But the Bible does talk about love in a different manner. From the biblical perspective of love, this book of Ruth is not a romantic book in which, well, it is true that there is a man and there is a woman and they do get married, and that's pretty great. But it's not the romantic idea version in which we think of, of in America where a man falls in love with a woman and the woman falls in love and they're running through grains of field with arms open to catch one another and embrace. Really, the book of Ruth is about a daughter-in-law who shows love to her mother-in-law who happens to introduce her to the Lord God. That type of love is seen throughout the Bible. It's a love of action. It's a love of commitment. It's a love that says, I am willing to do for you what you can't do for yourself. It's not motivated by feelings. It's motivated by the desire of the other person's well-being first. Do emotions play into it? Absolutely. Emotions come. They're there. But let me just start off because when we look at the book of Ruth, we're going to see the basics of love that are laid out here for us. And these basics of love, we witness the divine love that's on display in which God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But here we're seeing God so loved the world. And Ruth recognizes this because she is a Gentile. She is not a chosen individual. She's an outcast. And yet, she turns to the living God and turns away from her idols. She turns away from her family. She turns away from her friends, her country, to seek after the living God because she is presented with something that is superior and that is something better all through a relationship, a relationship that many of us mock today. That idea of, have you heard the one about my mother-in-law? How many of you have a good, relationships with, a good relationship with your mother-in-law? Don't raise your hand. I'm not asking. I mean, I'm just, just rhetoric. I mean, I don't want you to tell me. It's, it can be very difficult. 
But yet here in the Bible we see this woman has a great relationship with her mother-in-law. I think my mother-in-law and my father-in-law are some of the greatest people in the world. They are so nice. They are so giving. Now, that doesn't mean they never get angry with me. They get angry with me all the time. But I still think they are very nice people. And my kids are, are blessed to have grandparents like this. But as love touches a broken heart, those broken hearts are healed. As love touches a hardened heart, a hardened heart is softened. As love touches a dead heart, a dead heart is resurrected and given life. Well, the book of Ruth, as I mentioned, is a biblical story of love between people who become friends. One of the things that stands out when we look at the basics of love, it's important for us to see that in the very first part of Ruth, Ruth shows us a beautiful flower set amongst a bunch of rocks. A wildflower looks its best when it is growing out of granite rock, rocks that's just thrown by the wayside. You notice that. But when you see a whole acre of flowers, you don't notice the individual. You just look and say, oh yeah, that's all pretty. But when you see one individual flower growing out of a rock, you're like, wow, that catches your eye. And you notice that. So when we, come, we want to look at the rocks of Ruth to begin with. And that's really found in the very first five verses of this, of this book. But I want you to think through this. I've already read through the chapter. You've seen this. Think of the economic conditions that we face, or really that Ruth faced. What were the economic conditions that Ruth was facing and her family? Well, not Ruth, but Naomi. What's the economic conditions that they were facing? A famine. All right. So there's a famine in the land. And what, was the, what happened? Let's put this in your situation. A famine, so what kind of people perhaps was Elimelech? What did he do for a living? A what? A laborer, probably. Maybe a farmer. He had something to do tied in with the land. And he... And maybe some of you have been in a situation where you said, hey, I got a job offer somewhere else. Let's pack up and go. Have you done that? What is it like to be a wife of a husband who says, I, will, I think the grass is greener over here. Wives, what's that like for your husband to come home and tell you, I think the job over there is better. Let's go. Is that exciting or is it scary? What's that like? This is the part where you come in and say, I'll, I'll tell you. Help me out here. What, what's that like? <laughs> scary? So the economic situation or, or, that Elimelech is in, it's for Israel, they're in a famine. Apparently there's not great work in order to provide for his family. And he comes home to his wife, hey Naomi, let's go across the border. I hear that there's great opportunity to make a living and provide for our kids and we can get ahead in Moab, the golden hills of Moab. Let's pack up our family. Let's do this thing. I can make a go of it. Are you with me? And the good wife that she is, she says, yeah. So the economic crisis that she faces is one in which we perhaps have faced where you've had to change jobs and move. But while you're thinking of the economic condition, I also want you to think of the theological framework in which this is setting in. Now I'm going to press you a little bit on this, I'm going to try to pull out your theology a little bit on this. What is the theological framework in which this book is laid in? 
because the economics are directly connected to it. Let me warm you up. What's the first five books of the Bible? Genesis. Exodus. I'm looking at the kids. Come on, help us out. Okay, we've got Leviticus. Numbers, Deuteronomy. And those first five books of the Bible, there's a couple different names that, we're, that are used for those. What's, give me one of the names for them. The Pentateuch or the Torah or the Law. Okay, those are the first five books. Now, you know some of the, tell me some of the great events, or we'll say stories, things you would tell kids or young people, new believers, that took place in those first five books. Creation, the flood, Joseph, what? The great exodus, yes. Noah, Abraham and his promise. Jonah's not there yet. He hasn't, been, he, hasn't, he, hasn't, he hasn't alive yet. Yeah, we got Joseph. How about bitten by snakes? How about grounds opening up and swallowing people? Plagues. Lots of cool things have taken place in those first five books. Yeah, standing water multiple times. All right, after that book, what happens? After the last book, they enter into the promised land, which is God's promise that's supposed to be a land flowing with milk and honey in which the whole nation of Israel are going to come into, and it's going to be a great land. And so we got Joshua, and Joshua says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And for his whole time of living, he's like, yes, he is second command. He's followed Moses Moses is dead. He takes over the, the, the role in which he is following, and as far as his teaching goes, all the people are going to follow God, and they do so. And then he dies. And then the next book is called, the, well, it's right here, Judges, in the first verse. In the days when the judges ruled. And the judges are individual men and women who pop up, and there's something going on there. Before I get to Judges, let me just back up. What is God's promise to the nation of Israel when they go into the land? That is called, that is the Mosaic Covenant. That is God's promise. It is a conditional promise, which if you do what's right, if you follow me, I will bless you and I will make you great. Meaning your harvest will be great, all your animals will have lots of babies. Your women will have lots of babies. Everything will be great. But if you don't follow me and you follow after other gods, I'm going to kick you out of the land. You're going to have poor harvest. People are going to come in and oppress you. It's going to be really bad for you. So the children go into, into the land, and they do something that you and I tend to do the same thing. Our hearts tend to wander, like the old song, and leave the God that we love. And they start wandering, and they start searching after other gods. This is all the theological framework. And the reason I'm, I'm laying this out, it's so important for us to understand and see this, is that they look at wanting to do what's right in their own eyes instead of following God. For hundreds of years, they do this again and again. So they repent. They say, God, we're sorry. God says, okay, I'm glad that you're sorry. God comes in and rescues them. God punishes the people who are oppressing Israel. And there's so many years of, of really good things. And then the children of Israel go, huh, we've got it really good. We don't really need God. And they go back to sinning. God brings some, somebody else in to punish them, to oppress them. And then they cry out to God and say, God, we're so sorry. Please deliver us from this evil. And God does. It's a cycle that goes over and over through the book of Judges. And you're wondering, and the book ends with everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. The story of Ruth takes place in this. The economic condition is connected with, hey, there might be more prosperity for us if we go into Moab than stay in the land of Israel and serve God. That's the theological framework of the book where God has made promises to the children of Israel. If you follow me, I will bless you. 
if you stick with me, I'll make everything right. One other thing for us to be thinking through. I want you to think of the mental state of Naomi. What is Naomi's mental state? She's lost her husband. She's lost her two sons. Devastated. Yeah. For her time going, moving out of Israel, her family, friends, people that she knows, a home, following her husband. She's lost her husband. She's lost her children. She's really lost everything, or at least that's what it would seem. I don't know what it's like to lose a spouse, but there's some in this room that have. Some of you have lost your children. I don't know what that's like. I don't know the type of pain that that would cause in a person's heart. I don't know how a person would ever move beyond that. But it's important for us to try to get into the same thinking as we're going through this book. Here's where Naomi is at. This is the devastation that she is in. These are the rocks in which the flower of Ruth grows. In verse 6, throughout all the events that are taking place, and we come to verse 6, and in verse 6, we see love cares for others. And in this process, we see love makes a difficult choice. We're given background information, and then all of a sudden we see a decision has been made. And then she arose, Naomi, with her daughter-in-laws, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited, or this idea of, of visited is, is the idea of God has uh, attended to or come back to his people is the idea to give them bread. That God has fulfilled his promise again and restored to the nation of Israel food that's required for them, giving them food. In the mindset of the Jewish people, God is always the one who provides bread even though they're working in the farms. Remember over the 40-year wandering, God is the provider of bread. It took him, or really took them, 40 years to figure out God is the provider, God is the provider, God is the provider. Rely on me for your daily needs. I will be the one to take care of those things. Naomi comes to making a difficult choice in which no longer is she going to stay as a widow with her two daughter-in-laws who are also widows in a culture in which women are not, have no standing. There is no protection for them. There is no hope for them. There is no place for them to go. There is really very few opportunities for a woman and her daughters to make a living. House cleaning is not one of them. And since they are not married, they are open to all types of violence, evil, at the whim of any man. Because society of it in itself does not give them any standing or protection. It is not America when they are alive. It is not equal rights. Their protection comes under a husband. Now, whether you like that or not, that's really ir irrelevant to the, to the truth that's being here. But Naomi makes a decision because she hears that God is providing, and she repents and says, I, we need to go back. I need to go back. And she makes this difficult decision, and therefore she went out from the place where she was in, in verse 7, to her two daughters with two, two daughter in laws with her, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. So, picture in your mind, she has made the decision. They're packing up the few belongings that they have. Her two daughters, daughter in laws are with her. They've got their goods. Three women 
are on a trip of about 50 miles by foot, most likely, to make it from, uh, uh, from the area they're living in all the way back to Jerusalem, or Bethlehem is where they're going, which is too far from Jerusalem. Their hope is that they're going to make there and be unmolested in the process. That someone's not going to rob them or beat them or even worse. Hmm. But when making this decision, she is looking out for it. This would be the best decision for her. This would be the best decision for them as she's thinking through this. There's food, the basic needs. What do I need to do? Sometimes people make decisions on basically on that level. Is there food available? That's the decision I'm going to make. Is there protection available? That's the decision I'm going to make. And this is what Naomi's making. She's looking out for how do I take care of my daughters. But we also see that her love is looking at the ability to release. Because if you really love somebody, if your heart's desire is for that person, you're willing to let them go. In verse 8, as they're walking, this is all coming upon Naomi. As, so what we have here, the Bible doesn't really say, here's all the answers, just follow steps 1, 2, and 3. But we see Naomi is walking with her daughters as they're leaving the land, and it's really coming to Naomi as she's thinking through, going, okay, is this really the best for my daughter-in-laws? What's really best for them, as much as I love them, and they remind me of my sons, perhaps, and our life has been good together, what would be best is for me to let them go back to their moms and dads, for me to release them. Why? Because they have family. They have friends. They have contacts here. This would be what's best for them. But then I'll be alone. All by myself. It's tough to be alone. It's tough to feel that there's nobody for you. Even if you feel that there should be a whole bunch of people. But it's interesting, and I want you to make note that she says, return to your mother's house. Not your father's house. Return to your mother's house. Because these girls need a mother's love and attention right now. They don't need a dad's strong arm or hand. They need a mom who's going to come in and be beside them and put her arm and say, I understand how it feels. Your hearts are broken, and right now you need care. And she also says, And the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt kindly with me. Interesting that she says that because she blesses them. She is going through this horrible time, but she says, the Lord bless you. This idea and what she's saying, talking about is this Hebrew word called hesed. It means to love, have a loving loyalty. We don't really have a translation for it. That the Lord be merciful to you. That the Lord be loyal to you. That the Lord be faithful to you. That the Lord show loving kindness to you. If we were to think of our spouses or a parent uh, in our life, we might say, my parents have always been so faithful to me. I've never missed a meal. My spouse has always been so faithful to me. Loving kindness. Loyalty is, is wrapped up into that. And as you look back to the Lord God, God has always been so faithful to the Jewish people because he has never broken a promise to them. He always sticks to it. And, and she is saying, girls, I want you to be, uh, I'm blessing you with this idea. I, I want you to, that the Lord would be kind to you, would show you the same favor that you have showed, not only to the dead, but also to me. The way that you've treated my husband and you've treated my sons. You have been faithful to them. May God do the same thing to you. In verse 9, and it says, and the Lord grant that you find rest. Rest is not just a spot where you can sit down and go, oh, yeah, my feet hurt so bad, I need to rest. The idea mentions there, 
and rest is that you would find a husband, someone who can protect you, someone who can give you everything that you need. Safety, joy, security, purpose. Each in the house of her husband. Is this emotional time? Yeah. There's emotion. You can't help but notice that the girls, the ladies there, they're talking. And they're, I'm sure that the, the tears are going down and, and the noses are running and the, the words are choked. As, there's, as she's saying this, and you can hear, no, we don't want to go. Yes, you need to go. I don't want to, you need to go. This is what's best for you, but I don't want to. And all this is going on. And Naomi finally says, here, let me be reasonable with you. Look, turn back, daughters. Will you go with me? Really? And so she begins to explain to them, if I were married right now, and if I were to have a son right now, would you really wait until he was 18 or so, so that you could marry him? Now we're looking at going, what? That's like crazy. But remember in the Middle East, especially in Israel, that was the norm. There was a promise there that if one son died, it was the obligation of the other son to continue the family line by going in and having sexual relationships with the sister-in-law that a son might be produced. Remember the story of Judah and Tamar. That's what was supposed to happen. And Judah didn't. And so she had to trick him and that she was a prostitute. And you're going, wow. The Bible's so real. And the Bible's so raw. And you're thinking, if the, if the Bible was written by man, man would definitely cut that chapter out. Because that makes Judah look so bad. It makes the line of Christ look so bad. But the Bible's like, this is how it is. And this is the way things are. And this lays it out for us. But Naomi just says, look, it, it's not a possibility. So what Naomi's saying is she is way past the time of bearing children. It can't be done anymore. But these girls, they still are. They still could. In verse 14, the crying starts again. And here we see these two girls are making a choice. Ophrah is deciding to go back. She turns and goes back, but one of them doesn't. Ruth decides, I'm not going anywhere. So much so that Naomi goes, look. Your sister-in-law is going. She's starting to walk. She's returning to her people and to her gods. Notice that's plural. In the Moabite society, um, most likely they worship um, Chemosh, which is basically the same type of god that the Canaanites had, Baal or Baal, however you want to pronounce it. And it was a horrible, horrible deity worship. The idea was you sacrificed your children to these gods. Most of them were fertility gods. Asherah was the female version. Baal was the, was the male version of the gods. And since they're fertility gods, everything, well, I think you probably get the idea, was based upon whether the fertility gods were going to be prosperous or not. And same, same with your wheat, your animals, and so forth. Completely different than what Israel was, was looking at. So one is going back to all that. And Ruth is going, not interested. Said, on Ruth, we see a commitment. She commits. So my question to you is, how does Ruth know about God? Okay, so Ruth knows about God through Naomi. Anything else? Her husband's, or her husband, I should say it's plural, but yeah. her husband, father-in-law, okay. So is religion or faith real in that family? Okay. It's not we're Christians on Sunday between the times of 10 and noon, and the rest of the time we're secular. We're living real lives. 
Now, having said that, does that mean they're perfect? Does that mean mistakes are made? And we could step back and say, hey, Elimelech, you blew it, dude. You should have stayed in the land. Or as I heard one commentator say, Elimelech didn't really do anything wrong because it was really the responsibility of the Jews to go out and to be a light into the whole world. That was the Jews' responsibility. They were to go out and be a witness for God to all the world. Was that Elimelech's purpose? No, Elimelech was not going out to bring people to God. He wasn't doing it. He was going out to, hey, get some bread. Make a living for his family. Okay. What does Ruth know about God? What does Ruth know about God? What did Naomi, her husband, father-in-law, what did they teach her about God that do you, do you think caused her to go, I want to follow that God? Okay, love. What would she have told, what would they have told Ruth about God that would have been a loving story? Now, I've limited you to the first five books, six, six books. They're living in Judges, so you can't use Judges. You're limited to how much you get to use. Okay. All right. That God provides. Okay. All right. God saves. All right. Are these stories or are they personal to the family? What's the difference between you telling an event that transpired? in God's word to another person and you telling somebody how God has interacted in your life to somebody else. Different type of testimony, isn't it? Imagine Naomi saying, Ruth, I have to tell you, my great-great-grandmother She remembers and she told us when we were walking, they walked through water standing 30 feet tall on the right and on the left and the ground was dry and they walked across the Red Sea and fire was behind us and we walked all the way through and then we heard the chariots racing behind us and God collapsed the walls of water and wiped out the nation of of the armies of Egypt. Wow. Wow personal story like that is impactful. God loves us. God loves me. I know he does. How about the story of Joseph? Wow. If you haven't read the story of Joseph in a while, maybe you need to go back into into Genesis and read the impact that that story makes upon a person. Incredible. God's provision, how God cares for these people. God has chosen, we are chosen people over all the people. Hmm. It's pretty powerful. It's pretty, pretty amazing. And the commitment is personal. Notice she says in verse 16, this is Ruth's response as Naomi is saying, hey, go back. It's the best for you. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth has dug in her heels. That's my interpretation. Ruth has dug in her heels, and she says something to this effect. Stop trying to talk me out of this to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. It's interesting that Ruth cannot relate to God apart from God's people. It is not that Ruth has first met God and then falls in love with the people. 
Ruth has had encounter with people first. Specifically, probably Naomi and her sons first. And then comes to God. The reality is, I can't sit, I have no biblical evidence to say that she first became a Jew and then they got married. The reality is, they pr- probably, probably not. They were living in the land. And from the text, we can't tell if they were in there 10 years and then got married or got married and then lived there 10 years. We don't know. It's, it's not clear. But people get married and do things like that. But what we do know and can tell is that it is through that personal relationship, that human contact. And isn't that interesting that God sent his only begotten son in the form of flesh, in the form of human, to make that contact with people? What a difference that makes. What a difference that has made for all of us. And it's from there she makes her proclamation, your God and my God. I'm not going to be separated. Wherever you're going to die, I'm going to die. Wherever you're going to be buried, I'm going to be buried. And then she just basically takes an oath so the Lord do to me also, if anything but death separates us. Wow. That's a commitment. That's more of saying I, I came forward in, in a service. It's I'm committing to God. I'm committing myself to you. I am a committed person. Does Ruth love Naomi? I would say so. I don't know if you can make anything any clearer than this. This is, this is one of those commitments like a wedding vow. Do you? I do. Will you? I will. Forever, forever. This is it. Do you believe? I believe. And the next moment we see after that, when she saw that she could not determine to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. That does not mean that she stopped talking to her. They didn't have any more conversations until they got, got there. That's not, that just means she stopped trying to change her mind to go back into the land. And when they got to the land, we still see that Naomi's heart, she's hurt, she's distraught, and even though Ruth has just made this declaration that she's a follower of the Lord, and she's sticking to Naomi no matter what, we see Ruth is in the, or excuse me, Naomi's in the bottom of despair. And the people's response, perhaps it's at the very beginning of the barley season in which all the men are, and people are out working. The ladies see her. She, Is that Naomi? I don't know if her hair went from being uh, dark to being gray or if just the events of life has just caused her to age and she just looks beat. But she looks different where they're questioning her. Is that you? Life can really take its toll on us, can't it? You can get beat up from work, from friends, from family. Not sure where, where to go one way or the other. You may feel that your heart has been smashed, crushed, rolled over, and there's no capacity available in your heart anymore. But the book, book of Ruth reminds us that it is possible to love again. It is possible for God to stir a seed and to cause your heart to grow and to blossom. 